blessing to be here this morning. At least I have a crowd to preach to you. Um, the others have assured me that it's not all that fun preaching to an empty church house, and it's something about singing and devotions, uh, worship time that kind of uh, goes along with the message and kind of uh, gets us uh, prepared to preach. And I just appreciated uh, what was shared and the songs that were sung. Uh, Quinn just introduced uh, kind of in a way um, part of what the message is. And again, as he was reading through there, uh, it gave three specific people that were healed. So the coronavirus is not a problem for Jesus. Uh, we know that. And uh, he healed many people there. And just the, the thought that he's with us um, in the storms of life uh, is, is special. And I just want to greet each one of you this morning and also all those that are um, listening in, watching. I want to give you these words uh, that Jesus gave right at the end of the Great Commission. He tells his disciples these words, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And I don't know how many times his disciples would have thought of those words going forward of what he said. Obviously, they didn't understand maybe at the time what that Jesus wasn't going to be there in body, but that through the spirit, he's going to be with them. Um, one of the things they tell us in CPR training that that there's only several reasons why you quit CPR after you start CPR and one is when you get too tired uh, and obviously God doesn't get too tired to be with us and to help us so this morning it is good to be here um, I cleaned out my Bible and the last bulletin I had was from March 15th which I preached at baptism so it's been a little while so it's it's good to be back in God's house this morning a title for the message this morning is um, a place of refuge and so many of our messages kind of go along with what we're going through so this is again one of those and I, I want to get a setting for this so I'm gonna go back to the Old Testament <clears throat> when you think of a place of refuge um, like I try to do every so often is, at least every other year, I try to read through the Bible with the one-year Bible plan. Last year I did some other readings in place of that. This year I'm back using that. As I was reading through the Old Testament, we get kind of a little bit tired of the Old Testament laws. Um, but we know what they are, and most of us have grown up with New Testament teaching, we hear the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus, you know, adds or, or raises the bar on the Old Testament law. Um, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, but I say unto you, resist not evil, turn the other cheek. Um, so we grew up with the idea of of non-resistance and we don't retaliate we don't have the eye for an eye and the tooth for tooth I'd like to read a few verses from the Old Testament and it's really just jumping in and, and pulling out a few verses <clears throat> the first in Exodus 21 12 to 14 and I'm going to be using the ESV this morning uh, for most of my reading so that uh, is what I chose to do this morning Exodus 21 12 says Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, in other words, uh, he didn't do it on purpose, um, then I will appoint for you a place to which you may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Then in Exodus 21, 23 to 25, Again, just kind of breaking in. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now, I don't know what you think about when you read that, but it's quite a bit different than what we're used to today. 
um, we don't retaliate. We don't uh, we don't get back at people. You know, if we're playing softball and you break a guy's leg, I don't know if this, you know, you have a broken leg too. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know what all. And obviously, I think some of this was was when you do it intentionally, not um, in an accident. But if you do it intentionally, uh, if you knock out somebody's tooth, knock out your tooth. Um, so it seems a little bit um, a harsh, um, but somehow they they uh, they had this to keep their crime down and to keep those things uh, from happening. But when it comes to life for life, um, I think um, he sets up these cities of refuge, and we'll get to that here in just a little bit. But as you as you think of this Old Testament law and, and how I don't, I can't quite fathom how it all played out in their everyday life. Um, but somehow they made it work through their judging, and and um, yeah, they uh, obviously it was a way to keep their their crime down and and uh, there's many other laws there too and and how they uh, they repaid a person if, if something happened um, so obviously you would know that that always there are two sides to a story so it's um, what one person said versus the other person but when it came to life for life um, God set up the city, cities of refuge, and I'm going to read out of Joshua 20. Joshua 21 to 9. This is, uh, you can read uh, similar accounts of, of God setting up a place of refuge uh, in, um, I think, in Exodus and Leviticus and, or Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus, I think, are three uh, that they have. Um, teaching on this, but here they would have been in the promised land in Joshua 20, 1 to 9. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, Appoint the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there. They shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood, and he shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders of that city. Then they shall take him to the city and give him a place and he shall remain with them. And if the avenger of blood pursues them, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment, until the death of him who is the high priest at the time. Then the manslayer shall return to his, to his own town and his own home, to the town from which he fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, and Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kareth Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. And beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho, they appointed Bezer in the wilderness of the tableland from the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities designated for the people of Israel and for the stranger sojourning among them, that anyone who killed a person without intent could flee there so that they might not die by the hand of the avenger of blood till he stood before the congregation. So here we have these cities set up. These cities were a refuge, a safe place, a place where a, a person could go that had killed somebody unintentionally, uh, but it was a safe place. I'd like to read a few verses from Numbers 35 yet. <clears throat> Numbers 35, 25, And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of refuge to which he had fled, and he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the boundaries of the city of refuge to which he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the boundaries of the city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. 
for he must remain in this city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. And these things shall be for a statute and rule for you throughout the generations in all your dwelling places. So there's some a, a few interesting things in these pass in these passages. Um, first of all, I don't know how they kept these cities safe so that this person that was really upset didn't get in there and find this person. Um, but somehow they they kept it safe. Um, so in verse 20. Five, um, the, the man could flee to the city and he could be safe there until there was a judging but they would take him back to his place I guess or the, the town where it happened and they would figure out if he's guilty or not but even though he was not guilty and it was an innocence it was an accident he still had to go back to the city of refuge until after the death of the high priest. Um, kind of an interesting um, thought that the commentators would say that this was a picture of a high priest dying took care of that. Even though it was accidental, there had to be a, a penalty paid for that death. Um, also, the death of the high priest kind of was a time when a congregation would lay down a lot of their past grievances. Uh, it was kind of a starting over, and so that made it safe again for a person to go back to his home place. And also interesting, if the accuser would find a person outside of the city, like outside the city limits, he could kill him without being guilty. Um, how does that work? Uh, kind of an interesting, interesting thought. But um, bringing it up to today now, we kind of know what <coughs> taking refuge is. Um, the term shelter in place kind of brings on a whole new meaning. We took refuge in our houses to try to not get sick. Um, you know, if a thunderstorm comes, we, sh we seek a place of refuge. Tornado comes, we, we go to the basement. Um, so today we have God um, for that, for our refuge uh, in times of storm. He is with us. Um, I say I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, um, but as I watch coronavirus um, and all the things you hear and you you in in my mind it, it's almost like there's something bigger than just the normal flu virus going around um, so it, to me it, it gives a little bit different feel um, are things ever going to go back to the way they were is this a a new precedent um, one thing we do know is is how something like this, how quickly it can change the whole world. Um, so we know at, at some point things are going to change. Uh, the Bible says things are going to get worse. So just because for as long as we can remember in our lifetime, they have kind of been smooth sailing and, and they've kind of been the same. Um, there are things that, that could change. We don't know. Uh, if you haven't listened to Paul A.'s little 15-minute sermonette on ADC, why, on conspiracy, why do so? It's, it's, it's good. Because in reality, if there is a conspiracy, it really doesn't matter. We're living here in this time anyway. Um, so moving on about God being our refuge um, in, in a matter when we don't really know how this is all going to play out. In the, in the days and weeks and months and even years uh, going forward. What all is this going to be? You know, how is it going to change things? We don't know. Maybe it will go back to normal. But to me, it was a wake-up call of how quickly and easily things can change and, and things will just may never be the same. 
when we look at scripture about a place of refuge, I think Psalms nails it about as good as anything. Um, one very popular one is Psalm 46, 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way and though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. I'm not sure what all verse 2 means, but it's talking about some pretty drastic changes. I mean, if mountains being moved into the, the heart of the sea is some serious earthquakes movement, uh, and we don't even have to fear that. Um, so God is our refuge. God is that stronghold for us. But I'd like to move on to Psalm 91 and just kind of focus on that. Psalm 91 is, is a beautiful passage that speaks about God's protection on us. Just looking at these 16 verses in Psalm 91, um, I came up with 10 ways or 10 different things or pictures that he gives us in ways that he protects us. 10 different ways in, this, in these 16 verses and also 10 different pictures of things that he protects us from. And then he ends with some promises um, that of what he's going to do. So I'm just going to be reading through here. <clears throat> so as I read through here, just kind of keep that in mind. There's 10 different things that he protects us from. There are 10 different ways that he's going to protect us, or pictures that he uses here. Psalm 91. <clears throat> he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and I think the King James uses feathers, and under his wings will, he, will you find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. And when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This passage is, is, is just loaded uh, with different pictures here. And I would just like to look at that first in ways that he protects us. So in verse 1, he who dwells in the shelter, a, a, again, a place of safety. A shelter is a covering, a hiding place, even referring to a secret place. Um, when we talk about the shelter, uh, David sought shelter in a cave where, where it was a secret place where Saul couldn't find him. Um, so we have the shelter. God shelters us. And it talks about abiding in the shadow. Um, when it's a, a hot, sunny day, and you're tired and sweaty, you don't normally sit in the sun. You seek shade to get some relief. Uh, so we're, we, can, we can abide in the shadow, underneath the shadow, underneath God's protection, his shade tree. 
in verse 2, he says he is our refuge. Again, a safe place. He is our fortress. Um, this refers to a, a stronghold, a, a, I, I call it a castle, a fortified structure that is safe. Uh, it's not something like a tent. Uh, it, it's a solid structure. He is our fortress. Just giving pictures here of, of what he does for us and ways he protects us. Verse 4 talks about how he covers us uh, with his wings or pinions and, and feathers. He covers us like, like eagles do their, their young or chickens or birds uh, will sit on a nest and they'll cover their young with their wings to keep them safe from outside uh, forces. And he talks about the army. He uses some army things. Um, in verse 4, he is our shield. Uh, we know what a shield is. It's something you carry around, and they use it to block the onslaught of, of arrows and, and things from, from the, the opposing army. A buckler uh, is more of a, it's a movable structure. The way I understand it is something that they could move along, but yet it's a little bit bigger than what a shield was, that they could kind of maybe crouch in behind it. God is that. And then, um, if that's not enough, he says he has angels, and his angels he sends to guard us. God guards us through the ministry of his angels. He, they guard us, and also they, they bear us up. They help us walk so that we don't stumble, that we don't kick our foot against a stone. Uh, he's got his angels. So there we have ten things. God is a shelter, a shadow, a place of refuge, a fortress. He covers us with his wings, his pinions, feathers. He is our shield. He is our buckler. And he has angels to guard us and angels to bear us up. So that pretty much takes care of whatever comes our way. He is there and he can take care of us. So what does he protect us from? Again, Ten different pictures, um, the snare of the fowler. So the, this is a picture of a, a person that hunts birds and he uses a trap or a net uh, to catch his prey. So he, he, he protects us from that, the deceits of evil men. He protects us from pestilence in uh, verse 3. That is like diseases, war, or famine. He protects us from those. Corona. Corona. <laughs> Uh, that's part of that deadly pestilence. Uh, he protects us from the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day in verse 5. Uh, there's many things that happen in night during the cover of darkness. Uh, things get just a little more scary. Uh, the house creaks louder and, and the things that bang are just a little more scary. But he protects us from that. Um, then there's the arrow that flies by day, things that take us by sudden surprise even during the day maybe bold threats um, assault uh, there's many things that can happen even during the day and he talks about the destruction of the noonday and a plague and then in verse 10 he says uh, no evil shall befall you he protects us from evil the evil one And then just the interesting picture on in 13 where he talks about you will tread upon the lion and the snake. Um, the lion, that, that fierce, loud king of the jungle that, you know, we wouldn't dare come close. We could say we're going to be victorious over that. We're going to, like, just walk on him. Um, and the snake as well, that quiet, slithering beast that has this poisonous venom. And they were talking about um, one poisonous snake that was found in Egypt called the ass that it's just a small little snake and that its venom will kill you in just several hours. And there's really nothing you can do about it. But he gives this picture that, that even we can just not be afraid of even those things. Tremendous, tremendous um, victory there and, and confidence in God 
that he is going to be with us. He ends this chapter with this, um, because we hold fast to him, because we love him, because we have latched on to him, because we have sought refuge under his protection, he answers with these I wills. I will deliver. I will protect. I will answer. When we call on him, he answers. And sometimes it's not always that loud, audible voice, but he answers us. And just the whole idea that I will be with you is, is a tremendous comfort. I will rescue you and honor you. I will satisfy you and show you salvation. Um, even if we die, I will show you salvation. I have an eternity of blessings in store for you even after this life. So he protects us from, from whatever's ahead of us. And in closing here, I just want to just wanna bring in that Satan is our adversary. He is our accuser. So when we go back to our Old Testament picture of how a manslayer that was not guilty of murder ran to the city of refuge to be safe from his accuser. The accused was safe from the accuser. 1 Peter 5, 8, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Uh, so again, we have this picture of a person that leaves the safety of that city is all of a sudden vulnerable to the accuser to get him. Um, so we need to have God as our refuge. And we need to be, in order to be safe, we need to be under his protection. Again, another verse in Revelation 12, um, again, showing who Satan is says now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ has come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God so so Satan is out there accusing us and and telling us that we are guilty but yet under God's protection and through the death of Jesus we have salvation we are free uh, from that just several more verses uh, in Hebrews 6 that I want to leave you with um, as we go from here, as we face the next days and months and weeks, that we would just hang on to these verses. Um, Hebrews 6, 17 to 20. So when God desired to show us more convin convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he and guaranteed it with an oath. So we are the heirs of his promise. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the, after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus, our high priest, paid our price, but yet we remain in that city that under God's protection, as long as we're here on this earth, uh, we are no match for Satan. We need to hang on to God, our sure, and steadfast anchor. God is there. He will be with us uh, regardless what happens in the coming weeks. We know that we are moving toward end of time. We don't know when that's going to be and how things are going to be until then. But we want to remain faithful and we want to be salt and light, the church to the world around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you this morning. We thank you that we have a place of refuge, a safe place from things that tend to bring fear into our lives, that we can just, under your protection, we can be safe and we can, we can trust you. And we don't have to live in fear. 
knowing that you have all things under your control. We don't have to be afraid of our accuser because we are under the blood. We have been washed and we are safe from his accusations. God, help us to remain faithful and to serve you faithfully uh, as long as we are here. Bless us as we go from here in the days and weeks and months to come. We could let our light shine for you. We just pray a blessing on each one. We pray this through Christ. Amen.